I bet they're getting. Just one second. Oh, here she is, Dave. Yeah, I wanted, there they are. So, are we going? Okay, hello, everyone. Here and all around the world, we'll wave at you. Welcome to our Sunday sessions for United Israel World Union, our 76th anniversary. Last night, those of you here heard, and many of you over the internet, Christine Maxwell speak about uh, her father, her family, and new efforts in the digital and data world, and mega data world, to deal with anti-Semitism. The last question that was asked is interesting in view of today's headlines, and that is, Nehemiah asked, how do you quick, could you quickly tell us how would you distinguish between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism if people say, well, I'm not against Jews, I just think Israel is an apartheid racist state, as Bernie Sanders said recently. And so the New York Times published this cartoon they're very sorry now because they got slapped pretty hard, but they weren't sorry enough to not publish it. And this is very, very close to what Paul is now going to introduce, and it builds right off of what Christine talked about. And it's kind of unbelievable because this is worthy of uh, the Nazi cartoons that appeared in the 30s. We've got basically the Jew as a dog leading our president as this stupid blind Jew following a Jew dog. I mean, it is beyond belief, New York Times. Now, it's more than egg on the face. Believe me, whoever made that decision is in the hottest water ever. And so they've retracted it and they've said, we're so sorry and we didn't realize but wait a minute, you didn't realize? I mean, to put a Jew as a dog with the Star of David around its neck, leading a blind president who has no judgment, who's also a Jew, you see the yarmulke? I mean, it's unbelievable. So, with that said, I'm going to introduce Paul. I need to get back. If you guys could help me get back to... Uh, <laughs> Hold and quit. Okay, hold and quit. The, uh, there. Well, but my family. <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm glad it wasn't embarrassing. Good. Uh, go we have, ahead. We have to go right to, there. Yeah, no, you have to go to Chrome. Okay, sorry. That was a different talk. <laughs> oh, we love this. Yeah. It was a nice bar mitzvah. Well, when you come up, I'll let you do it. So let me go ahead and introduce All right. you. <laughs> So, we're now hearing from Paul Weinberg. Paul has been a friend of United Israel World Union for many years. He's come to our meetings, and he owns Alden Films, which is both films and book publishing. He's a distributor, Alden Films is the distributor of media of Israel and Judaica for 35 years. He's presented talks on the Holocaust and film at library conferences, Holocaust centers, and at the library school at CW Post College of Long Island University. For the past eight years, Alden Films has distributed the lectures of the Vidal Sasson Center for the Study of Anti-Semitism of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Paul has given presentations, workshops on anti-Semitism at new, how do you say it? New Cage. New Cage in 2016 at North Central College in Naperville, Illinois, New York, the mood and synagogues of JCCS in the New York metropolitan region. Prior to working in Jewish film, Paul was in the music field as an agent and manager of two symphony orchestras in New York. It's interesting how people have these deep biographies often that you wouldn't guess. 
He's a native of Philadelphia, a graduate of Temple University with the Bachelor's of Arts and New York University with a Master of Urban Planning, Urban Planning better known as MOOP. And he worked for the New York Department of City Planning and the Mayor's Office under John Lindsay in the early 70s. Wow. So, Mayor's Office, symphony orchestras, Judaic studies. He's also publishing these uh, books, High Maccabee's famous book. Uh, you can even mention Revolution that. Revolution in Judea. That's right. So, Paul, thank you for being with us. It's thank an you. honor to have you. Thank you for letting me Uh, one second. Let's get it up. Yeah, I messed you up. Uh, no, it's okay. It's okay. I think it's going to work, I hope. <laughs> ah, it's working. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you. Oh, yeah. We good? Thank you for coming to this workshop. First, I want to say that nothing in this presentation is meant to offend any person, group, religion, or ethnic group. But history demands the truth at all costs, and in particular, Jewish history. The Jewish saga for the past 2,000 years has been one of tragedy after tragedy. Unfortunately, our heartbreaking story must be told again. At the very least, we owe it to our millions of martyrs. As Ruth Weiss once said, it's lousy to swim upstream in a filthy river. Today, anti-Semitism is again on the rise, and we ignore it at our own peril. Okay, and you could see this is a, this is a quote by Lord Byron over here. Now, this is called anti-Semitism then and now, but I want to speak about before then. And before then, of course, is... The, the times of um, when the Hebrew slaves were in Goshen in Egypt and Pharaoh um, decided to kill the firstborn. It was when um, we were uh, coming out in the Exodus and Amalek uh, attacked the Jews. And of course, it was in, um, in, in uh, Babylon and Persia when Haman tried to kill the Jews. But essentially, this was more xenophobia. This was the hatred of the stranger. It wasn't the anti-Semitism that we think of. Um, and of course, with the Roman Wars. But Professor Jack Wertheimer, who used to be the provost at Jewish Theological Seminary, I once took a course with him, said, the pagans weren't so bad. Their motto would be, we'll worship your God, you'll worship our God. Um, and, and they actually, in, in a certain sense, um, respected the Jews in, in a kind of a funny way. I mean, killing Jews, but also respecting them. They gave them citizenship. 9% uh, of the Roman Empire was Jewish at the time of about 2,000 years ago. But the anti-Semitism that we're speaking about, the then, is the birth of Christianity. Um, the birth of Christianity um, starts with the advent of uh, the Apostle Paul. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an out of a Jewish movement, but Paul, you know, as everybody who's read, you know, Dr. Tabor's book, Paul never met Jesus. Paul wrote almost half of the New Testament. And unlike the, the, the brother of, of uh, Jesus, James, his, his take on Judaism was completely different. Um, Paul said... Um, he demeans and he attacks the Jews in their letters. Romans 9.11, Judaism is blind, not a way of grace. Israel is superseded, Torah abrogated, Jews struck with blindness. In particular, the Gospel of John accuses the Jews of deicide. The church fathers were even more extreme. Um, origin. The Jews will not only suffer more than others in the judgment, which is believed to impend over the world. They, the Jews, were a most wicked nation. St. John Chrysostom, the Jews sacrificed their children to Satan. They are worse than wild beasts. The synagogue is a brothel, a den of scoundrels, the temple of demons. 
devoted to idolatrous cults. The synagogue is a curse, obstinate in, in her error. She refuses to see or hear. She has deliberately perverted her judgment. She has extinguished with herself the light of the Holy Spirit. I hate the Jews because they violate the law. I hate the synagogue because it has the law and the prophets. It is the duty of all Christians to hate the Jews. Justin Martyr, for the circumcision according to the flesh, which is from Abraham, was given for a sign that you may be separated from other nations and from us, that you alone may suffer, and that your land may be desolate and your cities burned with fire, and that strangers may eat your fruit in your presence and not one of you may go up to Jerusalem. Later, Eusebius, who constructed a history of Christianity, differentiated Hebrews pre-Christians from Jews. According to Rosemary Ruther, who wrote Faith and Fratricide, anti-Semitism grows from this religious fraternity turned rivalrous. However, when Rome adopted Christianity, things started to change radically. With the Edict of Milan, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, and the former privileges of Jews and Judaism were annulled to be ruthlessly replaced by discriminatory regulations. The real changes were coming around the year 1000. Um, in the year 1000, um, Pope Sil uh, Sylvester II predicted the second coming of Christ. When this didn't happen, things started to get difficult for Jews. But the real problem, the really bad thing that happened were the Crusades. The first crusade was in 1096. Few dates are as important in Western history as that of November 27, 1095, when at the Council of Clermont-Ferrand, Pope Urban II preached the first crusade as a holy war against the infidel. This call to arms as a holy war energized the nobility and the clergy and the populace to a fever pitch level, with the Jews in the crosshairs of these newly formed armies. The priest, Peter the Hermit of Amiens, inspired thousands of peasants in their rampages, killing Jews in France and Germany. Pardon me? Oh, I, I thought somebody said something. Um, Count Amico said, we have infidels living in the Rhineland. They are the killers of Christ. These massacres continued along the route to Jerusalem, climaxing with the slaughter of Jews in Jerusalem in 1099, where the leader of the First Crusade, Godfrey Bouillon, who had sworn to avenge the blood of Christ on Israel and leave no, no single member of the Jewish race alive, burnt the synagogue of Jerusalem to the ground with all the Jews inside. Later, you had the Jew as the ritual killer. The charge of ritual murder, the blood libel, was invented in Norwich, England in 1144 following the murder of a Christian boy just before Easter was attributed to the local Jews without any proof. This became the new motif of Jew hatred that spread throughout the world with thousands of innocent Jews being tortured, murdered with expulsions, pogroms, and massacres. In the Middle Ages, the high point of, the, of Roman Catholicism and its spiritual zenith, the church was in principle a totalitarian power seeking to exercise <clears throat> unlimited dominion in the temporal, political, and spiritual realms with its confidence in its divine election to this role unshaken. With this, un with this increased power, the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, <clears throat> convoked by Pope Innocent III, decreed that Jews should wear a special dress to separate them from the rest of the population and to be a badge of shame. Uh, this was a round yellow thing called the Ruel, which was later, later adopted by the Germans with a yellow star. In, in Germany, um, it was substituted with a hat called the Judenhut. In England, the death of Hugh of, of Lincoln, another accusation of ritual murder in 1255, was recounted in Chaucer's Priorist Tale, giving a literary veneer to the increased Jew hatred there. Also at the Fourth Lateran Council, they adopted the sacrament of transubstantiation, or the embodiment of Christ, the host in a wafer. With this new sacrament, Jews were accused of stabbing the wafer, 
thus repeating again the crime of deicide. In 1298, Baron Reinfleisch led pogroms killing thousands of Jews in Germany for desecration of the host. At the same time, Thomas Aquinas and Albertus Magnus promoted the idea of the Antichrist, a demiurge born of Jewish parents from the East, who will lead a Jewish horde hidden in the East to annihilate Christendom. This hideous belief continues to this day among many millennialists. The Black Death that began in 1347 to 1350 for Jews was a tragedy which after the fall of Jerusalem, only the horrors of the First Crusade and the Holocaust were comparable. Jewish communities all over Europe were torn to pieces by a populace crazed by the plague, which before it ended, killed one third of the population, not Jews, but the population of Europe. Of course, Jews were accused of poisoning the wells to hasten the death of Christians. Two centuries later, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, pardon me, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, <laughs> repeated the lies of Jews poisoning the wells. One of the, one of the other things that happened at this time was there were a lot of Jewish converts to Christianity for you know, various reasons. And in 1242, 24 carloads of Talmuds were publicly burned in Paris. Um, this was uh, done because a converted Jew, Nicholas Stonin, said, well, the, the Talmud is a, uh, a book which you know, attacks Christianity. Also, Jews who converted to Christianity said there, there are certain prayers which have to be excised from Judaism. One of them is the Elena, which is said to this day. They had to remove part of the prayer. Um, let's see. The other thing is that the Jew basically was a pawn, and one of the consequences was expulsion. In 1290, the Jews were expelled from England. In 1306, from France. 1492, from Spain. 1496, from Portugal. In 1516, the first ghetto was created in Venice. For almost 300 years, Jews were confined to the small area with restrictions on almost every facet of life. It was to wait until 1797, when Napoleon liberated the Jews of Venice. Now, the Reformation led by Martin Luther produced a new virulent strain of anti-Semitism. This was in part because of Luther's belief that a Christianity without the intercession of the Pope and Catholic rites, transubstantiation, the Rosary ascetic orders, would bring the end of Judaism and the mass conversion of Jews to Christianity. With this not happening, Luther's attitude toward Jews changed from benevolence to outright hatred. In his pamphlet of 1543, The Jews and Their Lives, Luther wrote, their synagogues should be burned, their homes should be destroyed. They should be deprived of their prayer books and the Talmud. In a reaction to this, in Catholic uh, countries, the Inquisition was begun. Um, the Jews were expelled, but the crypto-Jews were the ones who really suffered. About the same time, with the, um, the, the beginning of the Renaissance, it brought in, there was some improvement for the Jews early, from the early humanists. Erasmus Reutlin shared a view of Judaism, though, as a primitive religion, and the Jews as a primitive race. This view inspired Voltaire to become the vicious anti-Semite of secular humanism. In the German Enlightenment, or Alf Klarung, Kant, Herder, Feuerbach, Hegel, and later Schopenhauer and Wagner excoriated Jews and Judaism as a corrosive element in Germany and German culture. This mass expulsion and other things brought most of the Jews being pushed to Poland. Poland at this time was a large country in Eastern Europe, and the Jews were sort of the middlemen between the Polish nobles and their estates. It was called the Latifundia. Um, but what happened was, let's see, get to the next one. What happened was these different ethnic groups sort of broke apart from Poland. And the greatest massacre happened with this Ukrainian uh, leader, him, uh, uh, Cossack leader, Himelniki. 
Himelnicki led his Ukrainian troops against the Poles, killing over 100,000 Jews in 1648. Uh, anybody who's ever read um, Isaac Bischewitz Singer can read about this, this idea. There's a famous book called Satan and Garay, which speaks about the aftermath of, of Himelnicki. What happened was Poland was dismembered. And they were dismembered in, from 1772 to 1795 between Russia and Prussia. Uh, Prussia became Germany, of course. Um, but the Jews who were in the Russian part were restricted. Jews were not allowed in Russia. So they, they called this area the Pale of Settlement. And this, incidentally, continued up to the 20th century, the Pale of Settlement. So in, in, let's say in the Ukraine, Jews could live in the Ukraine in the Pale, but they couldn't live in Kiev and things like that. They, could they, they were living there illegally and things like that. The big change, though, that came with Napoleon. He conquered Europe, and he sort of lit the fire of ethnic nationalism. Now, nationalism to the Jew, you would have thought, would have been a gift, you know, the modernization of society. But in Germany, it, it became pan-Germanism. It was stirred by Hegel's theory of history, Fick's philosophy of the German spirit, and his pamphlet addressed to the German nation, Father Jan, and in 1819, there were these Hep Hep riots against the Jews in Germany. In, in, uh, in Russia, you had a similar movement. They called it Pan-Slavism. This idea that Russia was the third Rome. Moscow is the third Rome, the, the czar head of the Russian Orthodox Church. And in Russia is where you had the birth of of you know, the, the, the best-selling anti-Semitic book of all time, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This is where it came from. It came from Russia. Uh, you also have the Black Hundreds. Uh, you have pogroms. This is where it comes from. It comes from Russia. Um, incidentally, uh, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and as an aside, was published in the United States by Henry Ford, the Dearborn Independent, in the 1920s. Um, it, Henry Ford, obviously, was a very influential man, and he spread this book all through the United States. Now, the, the, the change in anti-Semitism, one of the major changes came um, with, uh, with this this, this nationalism. Wilhelm Marr was a nationalist German, a member of the Burschenschaft movement, and he coined the term anti-Semitism. Now, when he talked about anti-Semitism, he wasn't talking about being against Islam or anything like that. It was against Jews. And sometimes it's mistaken. Well, they're talking about all these people. What are you, what are you talking about? He's just talking about Jews. Uh, today, um, uh, Jew hatred is now used in addition to anti-Semitism, to make it clearer. In 1879, he wrote a book, The Way to Victory of Germanism Over Judaism. It became the founding document of the League of Anti-Semites. First German organization committed specifically to combating the alleged threat to Germany posed by the Jews and advocating their forced removal from the country. Um, the great composer, who I happen to like, Richard Wagner, wrote this book, this, this pamphlet in 1850, Das Judentum in der Musik, Jewishness in Music. It was a hate-filled essay describing the Jew as the harbinger of decadence and artistic decline. He saw in Jewry an embodiment of the corruption of modernity and the born enemy of pure humanity and everything noble in it. Wagner represents a crucial link between the Christian Judeophobic tradition and the redemptive anti-Semitism of, of National Socialism. Um, essentially, with Marr and the, with Wagner, anti-Semitism goes from, let's say, in the old anti-Semitism, the Christian anti-Semitism, if you converted to Christianity, you're okay. It's, you're fine. Here, 
There's nothing that can help you. You know, it's your race. It becomes a racial thing. Um, Houston Stuart Chamberlain, who was Wagner's son-in-law, furthered this idea. He wrote a uh, book called The Foundation of the 19th Century, where he expounded the theory that all history can be understood as a conflict between the Aryans and the Semites. Semites not meaning Arabs, it means Jews. Um, to Chamberlain, race rules history. Sound familiar? And the influence of the Semites in the early forms of Christianity broke down the ancient world, which had to be revived by the new blood of Germanism against the abstract universalism of the Semite Jew. Chamberlainism dreaded a world supremacy of the Jew and attacked in every way their intellectual, moral, and religious qualities. From Wagner, Chamberlain, the philosophers of anti-Semitism, Stefan George, Martin Heidegger, was a small step to National Socialism and Adolf Hitler, and from Hitler, the Holocaust. As an aside, um, I just read the, um, which were, they were brought out, though, about five or six years ago. I just read some of the diaries of Martin Heidegger. Now, you know, Martin he all these people were denazified after the war. Well, I didn't really mean this, you know, it's taken out of context. And Heidegger speaks about, you know, it, it, it's a visceral hatred of the Jew. Um, you know, this is, this is probably the most influential philosopher of the 20th century. And uh, when you read this, I mean, it, 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 you, it puts shivers in your back that people would hate you so much. And this is for, coming from a man who knows that six million Jews, one third of all Jews, were murdered during the war. Okay. One of the, one of the outcomes of... Um, one of the outcomes of, of Darwin's theory of evolution was a new type of evolution, well, a, a kind of a bogus field, um, social revolution, social Darwinism. And I say it's a bogus field because social Darwinism was a way of saying you're poor because you're supposed to be poor, or you're, you're discriminated because you're supposed to be, you know, you're bad, you know, and things like that. And what, what happened was, this man, Madison Grant, uh, wrote a very uh, influential book um, in 1916. It was called The Passing of the Great Race. And he doesn't mean, he means the white race and he means the white Nordic race. Uh, Grant espoused the idea that Jews were not the original tribe of Judah, but Khazars. Uh, Khazars are a, uh, were a uh, people who lived in um, that hinterland about the Caucasus and uh, and Ukraine and the, you know, the, the Donbass Basin in Russia. They were an Asi Asiatic people. They died out 800 years ago. Um, but, but basically, this idea is still there that the Jews are not, the Jewish people today, we're not really, we have nothing to do with uh, Israel. Well, they don't call it Israel, they call it Palestine. So this, this idea came with, with Grant. Now, recently, this racial idea, is that Jew Jewish intelligence is a genetic flaw. Um, there is a, uh, a racialist um, professor of psychology, university, I think, of uh, um, Ulster, uh, Richard Lynn. I think he's uh, retired. And there's Harry Harpening, University of Utah, says that, well, Jews are smart because they have a, um, they have a tendency to Neiman pick disease. Uh, Neiman Pick is a very rare neurological disease, pretty terrible, um, you know, like a lot of neurological diseases. But most people have a tendency to some genetic disease. I mean, that's part of our human condition. And anyway, uh, this has become mainstream in many, many circles. The idea that Jews are smart, and incidentally, it's just Ashkenazi Jews, which means that Maimonides, Nachmanides, uh, you know, uh, Abu Lafia, Cordovero, Joseph Caro, David Ricardo, Benjamin Disraeli, they're stupid because they're not Ashkenazi Jews. It's absolutely patently ridiculous, and it gets repeated again and again and again. And now we come to anti-Semitism in the Islamic world. Um, Islam is the the youngest of monotheistic religions. It began in uh, Arabia, 
And um, Arabia had influence of Jew, Jewish and, and Christian influence. Um, Jews lived in Arabia, and so did Christians. Now, the Christians who lived there were mostly Monophysite Christians. They, they, they mostly were not following the Trinity. And, and what happened was um, Mohammed, um, you know, he, he, he had a vision, like Paul, and, uh, you know, he said, well, this is obviously uh, the true religion, I'm the prophet. And, and what happened was he, he goes to the Jews, he goes first to the Jews to tell them, well, I'm here, I'm your prophet. And they don't accept him. Um, bad move. So he goes back and, well, you know the rest of the story, he becomes very successful. And he writes the Koran. So there are parts of the Koran which um, the Jew does not do well. The Surah 47, 4, 5. O Muslim, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. Surah 3, 1, 1, 2. Ignominy, the Jews shall be their portion. Humiliation is made to cleave to them. Surah 578, those of the children of Israel who went astray were cursed by the tongue of David and of Jesus, son of Mary. Surah 929, fight against such as those Jews who have been given the scripture, Torah, as believe not in Allah. Surah 2, 141, those are a people, the Jews, who have passed away. These things got more extreme with their commentaries, the anti-Jewish motifs in their hadith, that's sort of their commentary. Uh, of course, Islam breaks apart, it becomes two things, uh, the Sunni and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the Shiites, and the Shiites. And, and, and there's a, people think it's like between Protestant and Catholic, it really isn't. It has to do with primogeniture, which one is coming from the, the the daughter and which one is coming from the, you know, the guy who is appointed. Um, but the, the anti-Jewish things, you know, wax and wane in Islamic worlds. And there are massacres from time to time. It was the tradition of Jew hatred was formalized in the ninth century with a literature of polemics against the Jews. The Hadith or commentary set forth restrictions on Jewish life which continued unto the 20th century. As dhimmis, Jewish life was restricted in every possible way in Muslim lands. Massacres of Jews took place all over the Muslim world beginning with the birth of Islam. In 1066, more than 5,000 Jews were murdered during Arab riots in Granada. In 1232, Jews were murdered by Almohad Muslims throughout Morocco. In 1785, Jews were murdered in Libya by Ali Gerzi Pasha. 850 Jews were subjected to, uh, no, uh, 850 Jews were um, subjected to, were murdered in, in Baghdad. Um, the last big massacre was the Farhud. Farhud was in, um, was in Baghdad. 175 Jews were murdered, and, and this is in 1941. And I just want to make an observation. Um, there's kind of this myth. Well, you know, before the Jews started a Jewish state, we just got along fine and dandy. And, you know, of course, and according to so many in the media, this is because of Israel's mistreatment of the, quote, Palestinians. And I want to make a point. The first point is that Mohammed went to the Jews first to announce his being the final prophet and to give them his prophecies. Well, in Christianity, Paul and later Martin Luther went to the Jews to tell them about their radical view of Judaism. Is, um, the point is that the place of the Jew as Dimi was a consequence of Islam's rise. The creation of Israel, in effect, contravenes all Islamic beliefs and ideas. There's no need for a bogus cause such as the Palestinians to cause this insatiable hatred. There is the reality of Israel and the Jewish people returning to their home, and in spite of the world's disapproval, creating a thriving country and civilization. Okay, now we're gonna to go to now, okay. And before we go to now, I, I just wanna mention this one thing. There was a rabbi in New Jersey back in the 50s, uh, Rabbi Joachim Prince, who said an interesting thing about the Jews. The apparent inability 
of the Jews to understand or predict their own catastrophes. It's true. In, in many ways, Jewish people are very naive about what's happening. Furthermore, uh, the great um, French uh, premier, uh, Clemenceau, Georges Clemenceau, who was a witness at the, uh, the trial of Albert Dreyfus, he said that only the defendant did not understand the Jewish implications of the trial. This sort of blindness has been true throughout Jewish history. Okay, today the, the, the new attack, the BDS movement, anti-Semitism for everyone, NGOs against Israel, racialist Muslims, black studies departments, irrational anti-Semitism, claims that AIDS was invented by Jews, Einstein stole his ideas, you name it, it's, it's everything. Everything you want, you know, for everybody. Um, the BDS movement, started um, at the Durban Conference. And what's interesting at the Durban Conference is, the Durban Conference was a conference on, uh, you know, prejudice and things like that. It became a, a, a kind of a free-for-all against Israel and against Zionism. And what happened was, uh, at the Durban Conference, they actually passed out copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to people attending. They really wanted to get them, get those juices moving. <laughs> um, you, have, you have these NGOs, you know, um, uh, this is a new term of these, you know, charitable organizations, Amnesty International, um, Oxfam, you know, Doctors Without Borders, and, and you know, they, they, they're doing good things. But for some reason, Israel is always guilty of something. They're always doing something guilty. You have, you have now, um, you know, in anti-Semitism, you have this movie, well, you, you have in, in Great Britain, you have Stephen Hawking, who passed away, movie star, scientific celebrity, Roger Waters of Pink Floyd, Elvis Costello, um, Pete Seeger, who was here, going against, going against, you know, Israel, going against Zionism, you name it, it's right over here. And you have, you have, you know, some absolutely incredible things, but I think this is a little out of order, but I want to do it anyway. Okay, but you have anti-Semitism among enlightened Christians. I'll go to the next one. And this is, this is really amazing. The National Council of Churches predated BDS by 34 years, immediately after the Six-Day War, and I don't know if, you're, if you remember that, if you're old enough to remember that. Um, Israel was being attacked by all these countries. No country came to their aid, nobody. And they said, it cannot condone by, by, it said, it cannot condone by silence territorial expansion by armed force. Later, David Stone, an official of the United Church of Christ, said to Gerald Strober of the American Jewish Committee, Israel might have to die for the cause of peace. Now, Franklin Littell was mentioned before, and um, I actually know his, um, his widow. Um, and he, he, was, he actually was a uh, Protestant minister. He founded the first Holocaust Studies Department in the United States at Temple University. And Franklin Littell said there was an insen this insensitivity from the fact that six million Jews were murdered in the heart of Christendom by baptized Christians None of them rebuked, let alone excommunicated. They, the National Council of Churches, strut callously on issuing their pontifical phrases that deal frivolously with matters affecting the life and death of real Jews, without any sense of how vulgar and pretentious they sound to Jews who have passed through the fires or walked through the ashes of Auschwitz. Okay. The, the fact is, this new eugenics right now, um, uh, it's very, very painful because there, you have a, an Israeli, he's now living in Europe, Shlomo San, uh, become a, he's become a superstar on German TV, uh, wrote this book, um, Invention of the Jewish People, How I Stopped Being a Jew. Um, th this idea that, well, you know, 
look at our, look at our genome, we're really not, we're not from that area, we're not that thing. Uh, we're, really, um, we're really Slavs. And we adopted this religion because we're really, you know, or we're Khazars or things like that. Unfortunately, um, uh, people like Shlomo San, uh, Aaron Hayek, um, they're very influential. They're, they, they've really, you know, they've gotten a lot of uh, ink over there. Um, interestingly enough, there is a, um, a Russian, now he's an American uh, geneticist, a geneticist on the, on the human genome. He's living in, he taught at Harvard. He's now living in Massachusetts. Anatol Klyasov did a study of um, the Jew. And he showed that you can actually trace Jewish, the Jewish genomes, 4,000 years. And the Jews are, are it, it's an interesting thing. One third have the J, which is the Middle East. One third have the R, which is Indo-European. He maintains it's not from Europe. He maintains it's from Asia. And one third are from Africa. And that's an interesting, and then there, there are a few others here and there, of course. But it, 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 it nevertheless, this, this, uh, this idea that we're, we have nothing to do with this. And in a sense, as a Jew, I feel like they killed us. Let's kill, let's kill their history. Let's kill their history after killing the people. Now we come to the academic de delegitimization of Jewish history. Um, of course, that's Julius Wellhausen. And um, Ross spoke so eloquently yesterday about the higher criticism um, you know, refuting it. Uh, but the higher criticism is, is alive and well everywhere. And it's actually repeated by a lot of Jews today. Um, but there's a new type of thing. It's the, the field of supersessionism. Now, this is not the religious supersessionism. This is the supersessionism of, of the Copenhagen School. This is Professor Thomas Thompson, who actually graduated from my, my school, Temple University. And he, he has done books on saying the Jews never really lived, and he doesn't call it Israel, in Palestine. They never lived there. Uh, and Thompson has become very influential. Uh, he actually has had grants from the UN. Um, here. Let's see. I just had it over here. Oh, here it is. He's been a leading figure in, the, in casting doubt and the historicity of the Jewish origin narrative. In other words, the, the Torah is now a narrative. You know, just like anything else is a narrative. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is a narrative. So they're equal, they're both narratives. He has worked on Palestinian place names under UNESCO. You have also in, in academia today, you have an attack by the humanities on Israel. Modern Language Association, American Studies uh, Association, um, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of different groups now are joining the fray. This is that field, they call it intersectionality, where you know, we'll support you, you'll support us, we're all going against you know, the, the people who have uh, you know, attacked us. And an example is somebody who used to teach right around here at University of North Carolina, actually the one over, the, the other one, um, Stanley Fish said, the questions you should ask professors is whether your work has influence or relevance. Even more astonishing is that at Berkeley, English department's fall course catalog, 2002-2003, the politics and poetics of Palestinian resistance, which will earn students four units toward their degree. The description is worth an extensive quote. The brutal Israeli military occupation of Palestine ongoing since 1948, has systematically displaced, killed, and maimed millions of Palestinian people. This is at Berkeley. And you can repeat this at schools all over the United States, all over the world. Um, my Felicia's, my wife Felicia, worked at Brooklyn College, went to Brooklyn College. She worked there for 23 years. She was assistant director of student activities. It's not the old Brooklyn College. Although Bernie Sanders actually went to Brooklyn College when it was 90% Jewish. But anyway, 
there was a case over there of Professor Casey Johnson. And Casey Johnson had a, you know, really nice uh, credentials, PhD from Harvard, you know, the, the books, everything. Anyway, what happened was he was up for tenure and he committed a sin. After 9-11, they had a teach-in. I don't know if you remember the Vietnam War, there used to be teach-ins. Okay, well, this was a teach-in about the evils of Israel and the United States, how they really caused 9-11. And he didn't join in. And because of that, they decided he's not gonna get tenure. This became big news because Dorothy Rabinowitz of the Wall Street Journal wrote an article called The Battle of Brooklyn. And what happened was, they didn't say it was because he didn't support their ideas. They said, Johnson is asking too much of his students. Fortunately, the chancellor of the city of the university overruled the department and the professor Johnson was given tenure. In 2013, getting back to Brooklyn College, it had what was in effect a Jew hatred conference with the president claiming academic freedom for not canceling it. With a tremendous increase in Muslims studying at American University's college, there's now a fifth column against Israel, Jews, and Jewish history. You have now basically departments of Middle Eastern studies, which are Judenrein. Jews are not included in it. It's completely Judenrein. And you also have today, you have a promotion of Islam and anti-Israel curricula at colleges. Um, you have, you know, uh, you know, a specious idea of history that being printed, taught. All right, this over here is the new Christian anti-Semitism. Very sad. Replacement theology is back, uh, and, and it, it went away and it came back. And this is that idea that after Christ, the Jews have no place in history. Um, if you were here four years ago. Uh, Simka Yakobowicz, was it four years ago or three years ago? He spoke about Christ at the checkpoint. Now, this is a church in Israel, which is supported by a lot of mainstream Protestant churches, um, which says that the Jews are really the Romans, that the Palestinians are the Jews. And no, I, it, it, it wouldn't be, you know, it would be comical if it weren't, you know, the fact that it exists, but it exists. The mainstream Christianity and the B BDS movement. Or even the Nazis, they say the Nazis persecuting the Palestinians who are the Jews. Well, that, that, that's something else. That's their current head of the uh, Palestinian yeah. federation. Yeah, he's an, he's an interesting character. His PhD is, is really interesting. But this is an interesting thing right now. Um, you, you have, um, you know, the, the fact is that you have in Christianity, mainstream Christianity, you have a turn against Judaism, but it's against Israel. So it's, we're not really against Jews, we're against Israel. So for instance, in the 80s, the Women's Division of the United Methodist Church began funding PLO propaganda. Earlier in the 1960s, mainstream Christians, Daniel Berrigan, William Sloan Coffin, later Andrew Young, equated Israel as a fascist state. The Presbyterian Church USA, under its newly formed Israel-Palestine Mission Network, came out with a publication, Zionism Unsettled, that resurrected the infamous 1975 Zionism is Racism Resolution of the UN. Later, the Presbyterian Church USA supported BDS. This was followed by the United Church of Christ, the United Methodist Church, and of course, European churches as well. One of the worst is the the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers, that portraying itself as a loving, compassionate, healing organization that seeks only to end suffering and conflict around the world, not only supports BDS, but contributes to conclaves and camps spreading hate about Israel, Zionism, and Jews. In 2008, the American Friends Service Committee hosted a gala dinner with then Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad as guest of honor. Unfortunately, you do have some important leaders, you know, Tony Campolo, Jimmy Carter, who were trying to, you know, create an evangelical church which is not friendly to Israel. 
Now, the, the former pope, of course, as we know, uh, John Paul II was the most pro-Israel pope and pro-Jewish pope in history. Um, he said that his best friend was a Jew in Poland. He remembered the Holocaust. Um, you know, but the, the church is not that way anymore. Um, the present pope is, has, has recognized a non-state for the first time, Palestine. There is no Palestine, never was. He's called for the internationalization of Jerusalem, which means effectively, you know, Jerusalem is no longer part of Israel. And he's had a tremendous rapprochement with the Muslim world. Um, and it's a sad thing, you know, after Pope John Paul II. And now you have the reemergence of old stereotypes. Um, this was a cover story in the largest circulation paper in Scandinavia, often blotted. And what made it really absolutely disgusting was that, you know, um, the story was that Israelis were killing Palestinians to harvest their organs and sell their organs. Uh, this is sort of like a modern day, you know, blood libel, you know? And what made it worse was the, the Swedish ambassador uh, complained and she was reprimanded by the Swedish prime minister who said, this is freedom of speech. Um, the Jewish question is again in Europe. And of course we know about, you know, the Durban conference, Zionism and all that. But let me, let me go, away, you know, go further about that. You have countries that have never had Jews, essentially. Um, Norway, I think the most they ever had was 1,500 Jews which is probably as many as, you know, on one block in Brooklyn. You know, it, it's nothing. And the, the idea of, you know, um, the, the anti-Semitism there is unbelievable. Um, I'm just looking for this one thing. I don't see it right now, but see it later. Um, one of their big comedians in, in, uh, in Norway spoke about the, the fact that if I were a flea, on a body of a Jew going to a gas chamber, why wouldn't anybody feel sorry for me? It, it was just absolutely disgusting. So, you know, this has become kind of, you know, accepted in Europe. Now, your anti-Semitism again today in, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, you have cartoons like these. You had a YouTube clip, How to Stab a Jew. I believe it was taken down. You, but one of the worst things they did is they did a 40-episode um, um, recreate, uh, you know, kind of a, a movie for Ramadan of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to be shown throughout the entire Arab world. Um, very, very painful. Are we, we, we have enough time? We're okay? Yeah, you've got uh, 10 minutes. I got 10 minutes. Okay. All right. This is the new, the new uh, influence of Islam on, on America, you know, the victimhood of Islam. I mean, I'm just going to give you a sign, I'll go quickly. Uh, I was at a library conference, New York State Library Association, and they were pushing this book, um, and it, had, it was a play also, which thank God failed, about Rachel Corey. Now, I don't know if you know who Rachel Corey was, but she was a, um, she went, she was a, she was a volunteer with Hamas from America. She was caught up in them, and, uh, and she, she died. You know, she was killed by, actually she wasn't killed by a bullet by the Israel. She went in front of a bulldozer, and the guy couldn't stop. Not, not a nice way of going, but you know, it was an accident. And don't go in front of bulldozers. Um, anyway, they, they, the idea was to make her the new Anne Frank. And this was pushed you would hear repeated ads on all the stations in New York. My name is Rachel Corey. When you went to library conferences, they were pushing this book. This should be part of the curriculum. It should be part of everything. But one of the things you have today is Islamophobia now takes precedence above anti-Semitism. Now, we've seen that recently in Congress. The big thing is Islamophobia. In schools also. In schools. It, it, absolutely, absolutely. It, it is very, very young children, and, and it's, it's very, very sad. Yes, yes. Um, it's very sad. 
you know, the fact is, and also, the other thing is Middle Eastern Studies Department's ethnic cleansing of Israel, Islam's new political influence, their triumphant campus. Criticism of Islam is, is forbidden. In other words, you can't do studies on them. On the internet, even. Well, I don't know about the internet, but I know in universities you can't. You can't do that there. Uh, this is an example. We, we're, we're, you know, we're connected to Hebrew University. Yale University started a uh, institute of anti-Semitism, and what happened was Muslim students and professors complained. What do you think Yale did? They got rid of the department. So what happened was they're now on one floor. They call, them, they call themselves IPSAC. I think I have something that I have some information from them. And they were just thrown off campus. You can't have things like that. The mainstream media has embraced this anti-Israel narrative. Um, pretty sad. Let me, let me go quickly. OK. Unfortunately, Jews have contributed to this. Uh, and this is nothing new. I mean, for 2,000 years, there have been self-hating Jews. Um, we actually have a film about one. It's called The Disputation between Pablo Cristiani and, and uh, Nachmanides. But anyway, this is, a, um, this is a man who has done some bad things. Um, and also from Eastern Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, th the thing about it is that he has contributed to a lot of groups. But I'll mention a few. These are Jewish groups. J Street. J Street is not as bad Jewish voice for peace. Vicious. Bend the Ark. Vicious. If not now. Vicious. What's happened with these groups are they politicized everything. So everything is political. Well, obviously Israel is evil. But the other thing is they have a certain agenda. And I don't think I have to get into right and left politics. But they, they were at Pittsburgh. Now, Pittsburgh was a tragedy. We, we don't ask who the victims were, what their political party. They were Jews. They were victims. That's enough. Now, Ben the Ark was there. And Ben the Ark, I have to say, well, President Trump, you can't come here. And things like that. This is what I mean by politicizing. They're, these groups, their money is coming from people like him. I don't know if he's paying for everything, but he's paying for a lot. $30 billion does do a lot of harm. You have other people conflating the Holocaust in Israel. Uh, Norman Finkelstein is a um, son of a uh, Holocaust survivor. He has made a very good living, a very, very good living, um, you know, speaking all over the world, all over campuses about, um, you know, about against Israel. Um, you have self-hating stereotypes. Uh, this is a common thing, unfortunately, in film and TV. The Jew is the weakling. The Jew is the, um, you know, the conniver. The Jew is this and that. And unfortunately, you have people like that um, here. Uh, you know, in, in academia, self-hating Jews, Judith Butler, Tony Judd, um, uh, Jews as agent provocateurs, uh, Tom Friedman, New York Times. So this is not a, this is a very painful thing. Okay, responses, we're coming to the end. Okay, there are other groups too. Stand with us, they're a very good group. Um, they, uh, they're not well funded, but they try to go on college campuses. Um, I didn't mention Hillel, I should have. QFI is a Christian group. Um, and, you know, uh, they have, uh, they actually are the largest pro-Israel group in the world. There are 3.2 million members. Um, they actually work with Stand With Us. They actually have QFI on campus. Um, that's really the hotbed. Then you have the old fashioned things. You have ADL, you have World Jewish Congress. They have not been very good very successful. ADL has sort of attacked anti-Semitism from the right, not the left. Um, you have now, and this is important, you can't attack any, anything unless you understand it. That's why you need academic institutions for the study of anti-Semitism. That's why you need Hebrew University. That's why it was a sad thing when Yale was closed down. It's very important, because you can't attack it if you don't know about it, you don't know its history. 
um, political activism, writing letters, talking to people, individual action. Don't support institutions that support this. If you're going to give to universities and they support this, say, I'm not giving it because of this. And that's an important thing. The last thoughts is recent discoveries. What they're finding more and more by archaeology and everything is not, not only that Israel, you know, the Jews were in Israel, contrary to Thomas Thompson, but that, you know, we see that more and more. We also see that Israel's response is not um, giving in anymore. Um, you know, they just had an election. They're a democracy with 38 parties. It's weird. It's crazy. Crazy type of thing. But there's something very important. Before 1948, Jews were not in history after 132. After 132 to 1948, Jews were just buffeted from here to there. We're in history again. Judaism, Christianity, Islam. We've got to get along. We're 14 million Jews in the world. They're, what is it, 1.6 billion um, Muslims, 2 billion Christians. We have to get along. We have to get along. But we don't cause anti-Semitism. This is not because we, we didn't do anything. We didn't do anything wrong. This is something that happened. And anyway, if you have any comments, I'd be ha happy to. Uh... Thank you. Yes. Oh, the last one, I like this. So before, uh, we, because of our schedule, we, yes. we'll have maybe time and lunch another time. Um, I wanted to mention two things. One is, well, first, something related to what Paul said, and then I'll talk about this. Um, what I find in my 70 trips to Israel, and actually I deal with Palestinians as well as Jews. I work on both sides of uh, the green line, you might say. And um, there's an abysmal ignorance of history. And I want you all to know this. It's easy to memorize. You can confirm it very easily. Yeah, sorry. I should. Oh, You're let right. Me, let me yeah, I forgot we're on camera, too. There's an abysmal history of Israel, uh, not an uh, abysmal lack of knowledge, just of basic facts. So let me give you one that you may or may not know. In the Ottoman census of 1900, the majority population in the old city of Jerusalem was Jewish. Now, even major reporters, NBC, CBS, ABC, MSNBC, they don't know that. So the narrative is that uh, the Israelis came in the 1880s, Zionism, and then in the 1940s and displaced the Palestinians. Now, there was some displacement because of the wars, of course, on both sides. The other fact is that all Arabs, uh, all Arab countries opposed to Israel expelled the Jews without any reparations. And so keep those two things in mind. My best example is Silwan, which is the most rad radical Palestinian area. And I'm, I, I can go there because I have uh, connections there, friends, that uh, say the guy that limps and does archaeology with the cane, you know, don't bother him. But uh, you couldn't go there. You'll get stoned. But you know what? That was a Yemenite Jewish community. It was founded in the 1900s. Yes. Well, a lot of that is 33 Candles, which is why I think they really should have a reprint of that. Uh, there is uh, some of the narrative that uh, David and Sure. Yeah. And a lot of it's even in Ralph's book, too, so another source. So keep that in mind. If you want a source, you say, well, how will I know all this? Joan Peters from Time Immemorial. It's the most important book, I think. You can read Dershowitz. You can even read Netanyahu, The Case for Israel. But Joan Peters started out wanting to refute Israel's claim, one of those kind of books. Joan Peters from Time Immemorial. People have tried to ban it, block it. People put bad reviews on Amazon. It's absolutely the best book. You know why? Because it reprints all the documents. So in the back, you've got the actual documents 
from the 1920s all the way up. So you don't have to dispute who was what because you can read the historical documents. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Paul. Well, thank you for, so you. Glad to thank have you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So uh, I wanted to mention this uh, lovely picture, uh, the woman and the dog on the hill. The woman is here. The dog's not here. <laughs> These are in the back. We tried to get a few rubber bands but please take one. This was taken by David Tyler. The woman is Patty, and she's overlooking the wilderness of Paran, which is basically where Sinai is, according to Deuteronomy and according to Habakkuk.